Okay, good, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, welcome to uh, this webinar where we're going to be speaking to you about the MicroFull application and providing you information that will enable you to be more efficient, efficient in um, submitting your application for MICA funding. My name is Charles Nebeze, and I'm the Vice President of Business Development and Commercialization uh, with uh, SEMI and also with the Mining Innovation Commercialization Accelerator. Uh, jo joining me on the call today is Douglas Morrison and, uh, and Sherry, who will both uh, introduce themselves shortly. Uh, but before we get going, I would like to acknowledge where we are. Uh, we are in the uh, traditional lands uh, of uh, the Atik Mashem Anish Naibag, uh, which is uh, in Robinson Urine Tutti area. Uh, so we are in the Sudbury area. Uh, the Mining Innovation Commercialization Accelerator, uh, for those of you who may not remember the background story, in July 20, 2021, we formally got approved to advance with the, with the MICA network. And in November 2021, we did our official launch in Toronto. And um, the MICA network is managed by the Center for Excellence in Mining Innovation and uh, funded through uh, the Innovation Science and Economic Development, which is a, a division of the Government of Canada under a, a program called the CIF program. In terms of an agenda for today, um, we'll provide you sort of four distinct groups of packages of information. Uh, we'll give you a bit of an overview of, of MICA, Douglas will do that. Uh, and then I'll come back in and give you a bit of an uh, overview on the application itself. Uh, and then Sherry will go specifically on the application form and speak to you about the application guidelines as well. Uh, for those of you who would like to ask questions, I would like to encourage you to please use the chat box to type in your questions. And also you'll be able to email us uh, questions on any of the email addresses that you have for us. And we'll be able to answer those questions. We are going to be compiling an FAQ over the next couple of weeks. So we'll also be letting you know uh, about that. Uh, following uh, the first 40 minutes, we'll go into a Q and A session where you'll be able to, where we'll, we'll read the questions that you have for us in the chat box. And we'll be able to unmute you as you raise your hand so you can ask your question uh, more openly. All right, so without any further ado, I'd like to hand over to Douglas Morrison, President and CEO of SEMI and also my current network director. Douglas, please go ahead. Thank you, Charles. Well, Charles has actually introduced me already, so I don't need to do that. The one thing I should say that I'm based in our Toronto office, and that is the traditional territory of the Mississaugas of the Credit, and it's also the traditional territories of the Anishinaabek, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, and the Wyandotte peoples. So with that, I'll move on to the safety share. Unfortunately, in both Sudbury and in the GTA, we have had several recent house fires that have caused fatal accidents. Uh, just this morning, there was another announcement of three children that died in a house fire. So it really, really is important to check smoke detectors and carbon monoxide detectors. We all think this is very, we can be very blasé about these things, but we should not be. And this is the springtime. It's the time to get on that, and we should uh, make sure that we take care of this piece of business. So that's it for the safety share. Thank you, Charles. This, of course, is the uh, six main partners across the country uh, with Semi on the map. Uh, I'm still unhappy with this picture of the map because it makes it look like everything goes through Semi in Sudbury, and that is not the case. We want the network to actually be a truly network, connecting every one of these centres with every one of the other sectors as well. So that's the map, but it just shows where everybody is for the present time until the network becomes fully alive and genuinely interactive. Thanks, Charles. Next. So the, the vision of the, the MICA network is to connect the regional mining clusters to cross-sector innovating innovation centers across the country to create a national network to commercialize innovations into the mining industry and use the Canadian advantage of SME-based innovations to create a national mining technology ecosystem. This is all for the benefit of the mining sector in Canada. Next, Charles. The, the basic mission of uh, the network is to build a national ecosystem of network, networking collaborative regional networks, accelerate the number and scale of Canadian SMEs engaged in mining and engaged in global supply chains, create the regional networks and rapidly increase the domestic and export sales for all of our SME partners, and to commercialize new late stage high impact mining technologies 
and have those exported around the world. And to do that part, we will, of course, have to attract the investment for scaling up different SMEs so that they're better able to participate in global supply chains. Thanks, Charles. Uh, this is the overall objectives. It's a national network for innovation in mining. It is basically in investing in and advancing made in Canada solutions, integrating mining and cross-sector SMEs uh, nationally so that we can synergize. We want to, the, the network will foster opportunities uh, and intersector collaboration to generate the synergies we need to help increase the number, scale, and market reach of Canadian SMEs as they participate in global supply chains. That's the overall objective of the MICA network. Thank you, Charles. Next. Uh, I'm not going to go through all these benefits of the MICA membership. Uh, it's far too small for anyone to read, but it will be in your package, and so you can follow up with these basic bullet points later. Overall, basically, the intention is to accelerate the commercial expansion of innovative SMEs by delivering commercialization services, which will be mostly done by Charles and his team in Sudbury, but also we want to expand that out to the six regional sectors as well, our centers, and so that we have all of those activities happening within the network. And with that, I think, Charles, the next slide means I can hand over to you. Awesome. Remember, the real information that you all want is from Charles and from Sherry. So I'm going to go on mute and let them tell you all the things you need to know. Okay, thank you very much, Douglas, uh, for that, uh, for the MICA overview. Uh, I want to start off by uh, just um, reminding everybody that uh, the MICA network, um, it really is, does cover the ecosystem that is responsible for, you know, fostering and naturing and, uh, and moving innovations uh, that are, are going to be adoptable uh, by the mining industry. So th this, this slide really shows you the, the range of organizations and entities that will ultimately form, you know, the, 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 the entirety of, of the MICA network. Uh, in terms of just giving you a bit of a, an overview of uh, the MICA fund itself, we did secure $40 million in total from the federal government uh, as per the July and November announcements that we made last year. Um, and of that $40 million, 20 of that 40 is going to go towards network support activities. Uh, 30 million is earmarked for technical projects. And for this call for proposals, the one that, the one that you're participating in right now, we're going to have uh, up to $20 million allocated to projects. Hopefully we can, we can get up to them. Uh, certainly um, there is a funding staking limit of up to 75% and Sherry will touch on this a little bit later on as well. And uh, there is an expectation that your contribution to the project will be up to 33%. Uh, sorry, the micro contribution on your project will be up to 33% uh, of that project uh, value. Uh, and then also, you know, there is an upper limit of about 2.5 million. So, you know, we, we cannot have huge projects being funded simply because we don't have that much money to, to go around. So we want to preserve as much as that as possible so we can distribute it uh, more evenly across the country and to as many projects as possible that uh, require it. Um, just to remind everybody, uh, when we did our call for proposals, you know, we asked organizations to, to uh, submit uh, requests that were going to, that fall under at least one of these pillars uh, for the technology focus areas. So we did ask for technology projects that are productivity oriented, and we did get you know, quite, quite a few that are obviously increasing mine productive capacity at lower costs. We also got projects submitted that are looking to reduce mining energy consumption and GHG emissions, and those looking to implement smart digital autonomous mining systems. And um, the other projects we received do address that whole idea around reducing environmental risk and long-term liabilities. I should pause here for a moment and let you know that uh, we did ask you to indicate on your phase one projects, which themes you, know, you were addressing. And the numbers came out even across the board. You know, so we had about 55 people say yes, and 55 say yes to energy, 55 to smart, and 55 to environment. So they were all about the same score in terms of the spread uh, from the, the projects that we received. Okay, now I'm going to show you some new information that I haven't shared with you yet. Um, and, and here's what we, we, we received. So we received a total of 107 projects in total. And uh, in terms of the spread, uh, 
a total of the of 107 projects came from 81 participants, uh, of which you can see the percentage is here. The highest percentage, obviously, of applicants are from Ontario at about 52 percent. And you know, when you look at the actual applications by province, you'll see that the spread shows here that Ontario is about 50 percent, BC about 15 percent. And then, in terms of type of applicant, which is um, the the figure here on the right hand side, you see that. 88% of the projects that have come into MICA have actually come from the SME sector, which is the small to medium sized enterprise sector. Uh, I want to also just remind everybody that uh, those of you who indicated on your application that you required some help in identifying uh, commercialization partners, uh, what I've done is over the last couple of days, you've all received a, a notice from us. Uh, asking you to, to give us a bit more information on what you're looking for in partners and also asking you to set up a meeting with us so that we can discuss this a bit further and meetings are coming in so we are moving forward with those meetings where we can have that discussion about what you're looking for in terms of a commercialization partner. Okay, so give a bit of an overview of the process to date. Um, thank you so much for submitting your phase one application. That competition closed March the 7th. Uh, the ranking process is ongoing as we speak right now. Uh, we've got about 13, one, three uh, mining companies looking at uh, those high level uh, project uh, ideas for ranking. Uh, and so we do have an industry ranking group that is looking at those 107 projects that went out. Um, you have received on March 25th, uh, an invitation to submit your full application. And I think you've all received that, okay? And then today you are attending this overview presentation. So we're on March the 29th. Uh, what we expect next from you is that by April the 25th, that you submit your full application. Um, and again, you know what, this agency, it really came from you. Uh, you, know, you know, we know you're excited to get your projects out and to get them funded. And so we would like to, to get the process going as quickly as possible. Um, what will happen is between sort of May, June, we are going to have a project selection committee, which will look at your full applications together with the rankings from the industry ranking group. And they'll be able to then make a recommendation to the board on what projects to fund. So in June, we are expecting that the board of uh, SEMI is going to get uh, 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 some recommendations for what needs to get funded uh, from the project selection committee, which uh, is, is, is a sort of a committee that's being set aside specifically to do the project selection piece. June to July 2022, we need to then go to the government of Canada and let them know what we are intending to approve so that we can get the endorsement on that. Um, formal approvals will only come after we have had sort of that meeting from the, with the government to, uh, to get the endorsement on what will be moving forward. And then we'll be sending out um, uh, formal approvals and also a formal uh, letter of those not approved with the reasons why they, they, they were not approved. And then we are, we are hoping that between July to September uh, is when we will do all the uh, project agreements and, uh, and kick, off, kick off projects that are having approved for funding. Okay, I'm gonna pause now and I'm going to um, invite Sherry who is going to kick off talking to you about the full application submission package. Uh, Sherry, please go ahead. Hey, thanks Charles. Good afternoon, everybody. So I'm going to go through the full application submission package and some of the, highlight some of the items in it the pack, uh, from the package that everybody received. So these files here that are on the screen should be exactly what everybody received when they got the notification to advance to full application. So there was a cover letter with the invitation. There was a budget workbook, the full application form that's to be completed, and the guidelines to help uh, guide you through the application and hopefully answer uh, a lot of the questions. So I'm going to go through some of the um, kind of the questions or the highlights of information that I, we just want to reiterate, whereas not I'm not going to go through the whole form or the guidelines in in detail here, but happy to take questions. So the application guidelines document is uh, was one that was put together to talk about sort of the general information about the program, the deadlines, what are some essential eligibility requirements? So there, I have a slide uh, on that. Some of them Charles mentioned you know, some of them are the fact that MICA will only fund up to 33% of the projects. So the project proponents have to have the remaining funding for the projects. There are stacking limits, which is another item. Um, it also talks about what are eligible cost activities, including what the effective date would be if a project is selected to be funded. So everybody I think has experience or knows that um, as usual with these funding programs, certain 
uh, activities are eligible in certain costs and some are not. So sort of number four and five go together, what aren't, aren't eligible. Um, I'm also going to talk about payments to ultimate recipients, which is once the agreement is signed, just reiterate stacking limits, in-kind contributions, and then there's also the technology or readiness levels or TRL, which I'm not going to talk about today, but they're attached in those guidelines. Okay, Charles. So as a start, so there's some essential eligibility, eligibility requirements, sorry. So for the projects, so MICA funding, although this is sort of a, well, we've always said it's a five-year program, but we're already almost a year in. So we really have four years of the program left, but we need to have results delivered from various technical projects throughout the program. So the maximum end date for a program would be June 30th, 2026. However, that takes up the full amount of, of the program. So we do want to have some programs or so, sorry, some projects that have varying completion dates within the first year, two years and three years after being approved. And that's so that we can have obviously successful projects commercialized and, and getting going throughout the, the term of MICA. Um, ultimate recipients must be carrying on a business in Canada and they have to be incorporated pursuant to the laws of Canada. I did have a question earlier on about could a, you know, a single proprietor, but they, they must be incorporated. That's um, basically a, an eligibility requirement that's from our funders. The projects must include the participation of at least one Canadian SME. And as you saw, the majority of the applicants are, are SMEs or would qualify as an SME. Um, IP created by the ultimate recipients must remain in Canada for a minimum of five years after the end of the funding period. Again, that's another uh, condition of our funding. And project activities must be primarily undertaken in Canada. There is some allowance for expenditures outside of Canada. Um, they usually require prior approval. Now, normally on a project, there will be some, I, I'm sure some people source some materials from outside of Canada. That's usually not a huge um, that's usually not a huge amount of the project, but if it is, um, I could talk about that when we do the budget is probably it's best to identify that just to make sure there's no confusion or issues with that. And then lastly, of course, if a project is selected for funding, ultimate recipients are going to enter into a funding agreement, which includes providing claims for payment. And also there's going to be progress reports that are going to be required so that we can monitor and report ultimately to, to our funder, which is I said. So on the full application form, um, everybody's received it. I think I just want to highlight a couple things. So it was in it was in Word format. So we're asking to please complete it in the Word format, and it will be submitted in Word format. Um, no more than six pages as answers to the questions. So you'll notice the first page is a bit of a table that has some contact information, asks you to select which technical theme or technical focus area your project best applies to, and please. Although for the call for proposals, we know that some people picked more than one because it is likely that some projects can address more than one, we'd like you to pick the, the one that's most applicable to, to the project or the primary one. Um, then there can be some additional documents attached to PDF, whether it's a Gantt chart, it could be a letter of support, it could be a diagram. Um, so the total submission should be nine pages. So that's the first page of the application, six pages of answers and two pages of additional documents. The submission deadline is April 25th at 5 p.m. Eastern Daylight Time, and the submission will be through the MICA member portal, which everybody will be, um, if you haven't already with your membership, you'll be signing on and becoming a member. That is effective April 1st. We'll have that ready for the, the submissions to be done. Um, and basically just encourage you to utilize the guidelines document provided because it does answer a lot of those questions. The only other thing I'd like to note that might seem not as clear is on the application form for the written questions. The first question, uh, for questions one to five, it's similar to the, it, it relates back to the technical theme. So to answer the, the ones, you can have more than one answer here, but only answer those that are relevant to your project. So for example, you know, there's a question that ties back to environmental. And if your project doesn't have anything to do with the environmental technical focus, it's just a not applicable question. But for the remaining questions from number six to 21, please provide an answer for each question, even if the answer is, is not applicable to you, indicate that it's not applicable. Okay, thanks, Charles. Next one. Um, and then for the budget workbook, so it's an Excel workbook, basically. So it's broken down by five sheets. So worksheet number one has instructions. It talks about the eligibility date for activities and expenses. So that will be um, 
oh, sorry, it's supposed to say May 1st, sorry, May 1st, 2022, Charles, that was a mistake um, I made there. So um, don't convert this Excel into a PDF, send it as an Excel file, please. Don't add worksheets or delete worksheets because everything should be in there. If you have a problem with the file, just contact me. Um, there is a deliverable sheet. Um, so you'll see it's entered by quarter, milestones and deliverables and costs. And you can add rows if you want to add more milestones. Worksheet three is the is the basic budget that everybody would be familiar with. So it's broken down by the cost categories that that correspond to the cost categories that we would be reporting on in our, to our in our funding agreement. You can add rows if there's not enough rows for say direct labor or subcontractors or something. Um, and then the project funding on worksheet four. This is where we ask where the uh, the additional funding for your project that makes up the other, you know, MICA would fund up to 33%. So where the other portion of your funding is coming from by quarter. And we ask uh, just to indicate if it is secured or not, or if you want to put a comment there. And then worksheet number five is just a summary for our purposes that shows total, ex total project costs, how much is funded by MICA and how much is funded by other sources to give a percentage of funding. It's just a calculation. So there's no entry required on that worksheet at all. Okay, Charles. So um, just to reiterate the stacking limit for funding, again, many of you who have done participated in any funding programs know that there usually is a stacking limit. So for this program, it is 75%. So the combined level of financial assistance from all government sources, whether it's federal, provincial, territorial, municipal, they cannot exceed 75% of the eligible supported costs for each individual eligible project. So that's the stacking limit for this particular program. In-kind contributions, again, in-kind contributions are not, are not eligible for matching purposes to leverage MICA funding. It has to be a cash contribution. So, it, however, we do recognize that in-kind is a, is a huge part, an important part of a lot of projects. So we will want to collect the information and report on it as we build it into the progress reporting of projects. You just can't, in the budget workbook, when we ask for what are the, the, the matching funding, that you're using to bring to the project, in-kind contribution is not eligible to, to secure the MICA funding. And finally, um, at the end of it all, the payments to the ultimate recipients, just so everybody knows, the uh, if approved for funding for the project, there will be a funding agreement to enter into. And the funding of projects is basically, it's going to be claims-based. So ultimate recipients would undertake the projects, they would submit um, claims quarterly, with documentation, et cetera, and there will be progress reporting. And then once those are processed, they would be, uh, the claims would be paid to the ultimate recipients. So it is a claims-based system. And that's it for highlights that I have, but um, happy to answer any questions if there's some that aren't. Um, hey, all right, thank you very much, Sherry. Um, I'm gonna stop sharing the, the PowerPoint deck, uh, but before I do that, I wanna just highlight that if you'd like to email us a question, please kindly email it to info at micanetwork.ca. And we are actually able to check those emails live as well. So if there's any pressing question that it's come by email, we'll answer it in that format. Okay, so as I said, I was gonna stop sharing the screen and now I'm gonna move on to the questions. Sherry, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna read out the question for the benefit of everybody. And then we can just answer the questions as, as we go along. Okay, so the first question I have here is um, um, from Andrew. Can you please let us know what is the adjudication criteria are? Um, I think here, Andrew is referring to the project selection criteria that's gonna be utilized to select projects. Andrew, those criteria are being developed and being finalized because we do wanna get some additional feedback from the project selection committee itself. Uh, but I'm gonna to defer to Douglas if he wants to add any additional details to, to that. Douglas, I'll unmute you right away. Go ahead. Yes, I need to unmute myself as well. Okay, there we go. So yes, so the, the are uh, quite a few technical uh, questions involved in the evaluation committee, but I said also requires of us some other uh, issues to be addressed that are not explicitly technical. So they want us to answer questions, uh, for example, how likely it will be or how easy it will be for uh, solutions to be adopted in other mining jurisdictions other than Canada. They want to know uh, how it might help uh, remote and Aboriginal communities to become more involved in the mining sector. So 
the, the kinds of questions that ISIL are requiring of us are not purely technical, they're also commercial and to a degree social questions. Uh, we're finalizing those now and they will be available very shortly. Uh, thank you, thank you for that. Sherry, do you wanna to add to that answer? Um, no, I'm, I'm okay, that's good. Okay, thank you. Okay, next question is from Paul. Uh, the question is, it was really to reiterate, Sherry, uh, people are asking about in-kind. Uh, can you maybe just reiterate uh, the, uh, the okay. relationship between MICA, yep. Project Cash, so, and in-kind? Sure. So in, in there are some funding programs where you can uh, leverage in-kind. So, um, you know, I'll, I'll just give a very simple example. Let's say your, your project was $100,000 and you wanted to get $50,000 from from MICA and you had to have matching contributions, but you could claim $50,000 um, as let's say data provided from a mine site for the project as an in-kind contribution to be able to secure the 50. That we cannot do with the MICA program. Um, it needs to be actual uh, cash contributions. Now, I know when we had a webinar earlier, some people were a little bit, um, there was a bit of confusion between the cash and in-kind. So if a project proponent is undertaking a project, you're undertaking the project yourself and MICA is gonna give you $25,000 towards the project and you need to come up with another 75,000, let's say. As the project proponent or the ultimate recipient, if you're undertaking the project and you're paying for those costs to undertake the project, that is actually a cash contribution to the project because you're paying, like you're putting out the cash outlay to incur those expenses. That I know some people think that's in kind because it's coming from your own organization, but that would actually count as a cash contribution. So when you think about it, because it's claims based, if you were to think about putting in a, a claim, let's say, so you, let's say you do your first quarter and you put in a claim and you've spent a hundred thousand on the project and Mike is going to give you 25, the other 75 that you've paid for has come from, it, it could be, a, that could be a cash contribution from yourself. Now, you know, that doesn't mean that you might not have um, some funding provided by other partners, but I think it was just the distinction between in-kind and cash for the actual uh, project proponents undertaking it. So I don't know if that makes it any clearer. Um, like I said, we do know, we do recognize that, that in-kind is a really important part of the projects, especially when you have, depending on the project we've seen before where you know, if it's being worked, uh, if there's a demonstration being done at a mine site, let's say, for example, well, if you're doing the demonstration at the mine site, the mine, you know, they may not charge you to do the demonstration at the mine site, or they may provide you with data, but they will provide you with access and maybe some other staff while you're on there. That's an in-kind contribution from them. And although you can't use that to leverage to secure MICA funding, it's an important part of the project and we'd like to capture it. So the reporting and progress reports will have a mechanism to capture that um, because we we believe it does add to the, the total value of the project. It's just not from a leveraging perspective eligible to leverage for cash from MICA. Thank you for that, Sherry. Appreciate it. Uh, we have a question here from Johan. And the question is uh, for us to clarify, uh, when we're talking about project timeline, um, do we mean the end of construction and commissioning of equipment period and start of commercial operations, or can it include one to two years of commercial operations? Um, I think the answer to this question is that, um, look, we would like to see your project reach its objectives uh, before the end of the MICA network's funding period, which is, uh, I think the last date for MICA funding will be, oh, no, sorry, for the network is September 2020, 2026, but I think we moved it a little bit back for final claims to maybe a quarter before that. I think Sherry can maybe shed light as to how, what is the, the deadline for end of projects? Yeah, I think it was the, the well, the June 30th, 2026 is to have sort of commercial, I, I guess it's just the question is what's the, what is the delineation point meaning like the end of a project? Is that, mm -hmm. is that sort of what the question is or I'm not, I just wanna make sure I'm answering it correctly. Maybe yes, I, I see Johan shaking his head. Yes. <laughs> okay. So I mean, well, maybe Douglas, I'll, I'm going to pass this on to you to answer the best the best way because, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I know how to, uh, what it is, but I don't know if I can explain it as well. That's all. Yeah. Well, I'll do my best. Okay. We don't need to see uh, these projects moving into an operational setting. That's not right. really the final objective. We're hoping to get them closer to that point so that the, we can all see where the commercial 
uh, future of the solution will be. Uh, it's going to be different for every single project. I don't think at this stage we can actually predict exactly what the answer is for each individual one. And these are the kinds of issues that the project selection committee will take into consideration when they approve the projects. Uh, we're really trying to get solutions that are somehow hung up partly through the process, accelerated to, through to the end of the process so that they become a commercially viable product or service. That doesn't mean that you already have sales or that you have contracts, etc. It means that well, we can see that it's now become a commercially viable product or service that goes into the marketplace. I hope that helps. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, okay, next question is from Mike. Uh, Mike from Rail Hall. Uh, hello, Mike. Uh, the question is, does primarily in Canada mean 51%? And the answer is yes. Uh, it has to have that primary Canadian ownership. So 51% will be, will be accurate. And I think that question is fine. Uh, the next question is from Mo. And it, what is the frequency of the funding reports? Uh, Mo, the answer to that one is, uh, is quarterly reports. Uh, but I will let you know that um, there may be some special circumstances where the government of Canada may come to us with uh, a special request for reports, and we would be all then maybe transfer some of that down to, to the MICA funded projects as well uh, for those reports. But quarterly is what the expectation is officially. Okay, next question is from Oliver. Uh, Oliver, uh, question is, can employment expense outside Canada be eligible? Uh, Sherry, I'll let you answer that one. Yeah, I think that would be looked at as the same as any. I can clarify that, I'll get clarification, but I think that would fall under the percentage of expenses that uh, there's a limit as to how much of the expenses can be incurred outside of Canada. So whether it's employment expenses or purchasing material, I think it's it's all falls under that. And um, I think it's a 5% is, is the maximum for the project, but I will double check that and put it on our FAQs. Okay, sure. yeah. Sherry. Uh, next question is from Deborah. Uh, Deborah's question is, does the non-MICA two thirds of the project costs have any restrictions around where it is spent? Sherry, I think this one is for you as well. Um, well, it does in a sense because MICA, if you want MICA to fund one third of the cost, that total cost has to abide by sort of the, the, the guidelines and the rules, right? So I guess I'm thinking, I don't know how you can split the cost. Um, like, cause if you, if you spend a hundred dollars um on a widget that you have to buy and mike is going to fund uh a third of that cost that we're funding a third of the cost that's incurred so that cost should be incurred within canada like are you just i guess the question is can that if you prorate it, it it just all goes back to the limit on what the total costs of the project can be that are incurred outside of canada for mica to fund a third of those costs okay Thank you for that, Sherry. Uh, and Deborah, if you need more clarity on that one, just maybe send another question at the bottom or we can follow up by email as well. Uh, next question is from Jason. Uh, and the question is, if a project is staged from pilot to commercial installation, can multiple funding applications be made or is a complete multi-stage application necessary? Um, again, like, look, I've encouraged people to submit as full an application as, as, as they wish for the, the piece that they want to be funded by MICA. And also we encourage people to submit more than one project if they so desire. So I think I'm gonna just throw that back to you, Jason, and say like, look, it really comes down to, to how you wanna package your project for MICA funding. Um, if, if your distinct project phases are, are completely, are, are different, she didn't enough, then you may have a reason to submit multiple applications. But again, I, I think I would encourage you to maybe make that judgment call on your own to see you know, what is it exactly that you think will be critical to be funded by MICA. Um, multiple projects will obviously mean that you, know, you will be in the competition pool with other multiple projects that are also being submitted by other people into the MICA funding pool. Uh, does anyone want to add to that, Douglas or Sherry? Um the only thing I would add to that is if there are di very distinct phases, you could you could indicate that somehow in um, perhaps in your um, in the application or maybe even in even in the budget, if you can, I, I don't know, like uh, maybe we can have a discussion about that. Maybe it's, you know, a way to in the expenses to show sort of like phase one, phase two, phase three. I don't um, that that might be an option as well. Um, just a thought. 
we've had that happen before. So. Okay. Uh, Douglas, if you want to speak, put your hand up and I will unmute you just in case. <laughs> okay. I am seeing you on the camera. Okay. Uh, next question is from uh, Bernard. Uh, and the question is, if a project cost is site specific and the site is not yet identified, the budget book cannot be filled in a final or solid way. Is it okay if it's just approximate conceptual level? Uh, Sherry, what are, what are your thoughts on that one? Yeah, for sure. Because I mean, as long as the, you know, the line item is, you know, I don't know, site cost or something. And it, it's an it's an approximation. I mean, it's a budget, right? And as you move forward, by the time we go through the process and then, um, you know, get to the funding agreement, hopefully by then it's a little bit more sort of firm or a little bit more known. But, you know, at the end of the day, it is a budget. So, I mean, we all know that they're not always 100%. So for sure, it can definitely be in there. Okay, thank you for that. Uh, next question is from uh, Rebecca from Rethink Green. Uh, and the question is uh, uh, around stacking limits again. Uh, is the 75% each line item or 75% total project costs? Uh, total they, project costs. Total project costs. Yeah. Okay. All yeah. right. You got that one. Yeah, and I think the reason for that is, you know, like, look, based on the quarter that you are putting a claim for, you may not have any particular government related um, um, revenues coming in for that period of time, but then it may be a little bit higher in the next quarter. So that will vary for sure. Okay, another question from Mike from our real hole. Uh, please define in kind. Uh, and just to clarify, we have third party vendors and partners that want to provide services and materials. Uh, they will not provide cash. Uh, Sherry, do you want to reiterate the in-kind piece or is what yeah. you've already answered sufficient for this answer? Um, well, I think I explained it, but this would definitely be considered in-kind, right? So because they're going to provide you with some services or materials, um, but you can't really put that in, you can't put that in the budget as an eligible cost to be able to get funding from MICA because it would be definitely considered in-kind. Okay. And, and Sherry, just on that same point of in-kind, Deborah has a question and she's, she's maybe more specific in saying, does that mean the only eligible expenses are to third parties? No, actually what she's saying is exactly what I sort of want to define in-kind. So if a project recipient pays their employees to work on the project, is this in-kind? No. So at the beginning, when I said sort of, if you undertake and you pay the expenses on the project, that's actually a cash, you're bringing cash to the project because you're paying for the expenses. So it's not expenses that ultimate recipients or project recipients pay for that is considered a cash contribution to the project because you're funding the project. Yeah. Perfect. Thank you for that, Sherry. Okay. The next question is about uh, when do we actually turn around payments after we receive claims? You know, if we could do it immediately, we would. <laughs> However, we also do have to take your claims and then claim again uh, to, 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 to the government. But look, the team that we're working with at, uh, at ISED is super responsive. And so we don't anticipate delays, uh, but Sherry, can you give an indication in terms of days? Yeah, I, I would say day? sort of the Mac, it's usually around a 45 day is the sort of the biggest sort of window that we use right now uh, with yeah. ISED, so yeah. Okay, thank you for that. That's right. at the uh, that's at the end, like the, that's sort of the widest window, I think. Yeah. Okay. Thank you for that, Sherry. Uh, next question from Chris, uh, and the question from Chris is on the Excel, I, I guess the budget workbook, um, deliverables. It looks like the dates in column A for the quarters are wrong. Could oh. you please clarify this, um, Sherry? Maybe. You know, just maybe check that. Um, I'll double check it and go back. Yep. Okay. Okay. We'll come, so we'll come back to that in a moment. Okay. Oh, hang uh, on. Wait a second. It could be. Go ahead. Uh, no, it, um, if you're meaning the months, sort of like that, my June, July, August, September, October, November, December. Oh, okay, I'm, I'm not sure. So I have Q1, so 2023, okay. It's because Q1 2023 to me means fiscal 2023 because the government, they're based on the government fiscal year, yeah. which starts April 1st, 2022 goes to, so although, um, Oh, the first one says 2016. So it's Q1 2023 means fiscal 2023, which would end in May, sorry, March 31st, 2023. So yeah, that, that's how I that's how I do them. So it's, it's a little bit confusing. Yeah. I know what you're probably thinking that Q1 should be 2022 because yeah. that's the calendar year, but I'm using the fiscal year, but yeah. 
okay. And Chris, if, if that doesn't clarify enough, just send yeah. an email and we can follow up with you on that for sure. There okay, next question is from that. Andres. And the question is, uh, with respect to leaving the IP, with IP leaving Canada over between, between the first five years, is that applications or patent ownership? Um, Douglas, you want to take a step at that one on the patent question? Uh, I just the question is, oh, sorry, I'm going to unmute you. Uh, just to say back the question again to everybody, this is in respect to IP leaving Canada for, for within the first five years. Is that concerning applications or patent ownership? Right. So it, it's all of those things. Basically, the objective here is to fund the projects that, we, that are essentially owned by Canadian companies and have them retain that uh, particular proprietary information in Canada for a further five years. The objective is not to then have government funding being used for the first five years and then the week after the program closes, sell to a global or international corporation. So the IP then is lost to Canada and it's actually gained by whichever country is the host country of the, the buyer of the company or the IP or the technology. So that's really the objective. The objective here is to build up the, the number and scale of Canadian SMEs that engage in the global mining sector. And that's not accomplished if a week after the program comes to an end, funded by the Canadian government, that then that, that IP or that technology is then purchased by uh, a foreign company. That can continue indefinitely, of course. And so the, the limit that's been set by the, by the government uh, I said department is five years. Now, even within that, there are other agreements that can be arranged. So sometimes if the check is big enough, then it, it's clear that it can't, there's no way to stop that IP becoming a global IP. And uh, then that moves it into another kind of discussion on in terms of what the long-term benefit to Canada might be. So, that's basically where we are with the funding that we have. It's not there to generate uh, technologies that then become internationalized through international global companies. It's there to be internationalized by Canadian companies. That's the objective. Okay. Thank you very much, Douglas. Uh, Sherry, the next question I think is one that you could give us some insight on. And the question is, can you speak to the rates for chargeback uh, expenses, et cetera? I'm um, not sure what the expenses piece means, but the chargeback part, could you clarify or maybe give an answer to that one, Sherry? Sorry, chargeback, right? Um, okay. So, I mean, basically the expenses that are incurred, um, specifically if you look at the uh, applications guidelines, so it talks specifically from a labor perspective, it's direct salary costs. So there is um, the opportunity to have an indirect cost component that's in there and the guideline for that is approximately 55% from ICED's guidelines. So it's basically base salary um, and then 55% would cover um, your benefits, anything else like that and sort of overhead type costs. Other expenses, the bottom line for eligible expenses is within those categories is they need to be specifically incurred uh, in the undertaking of the project is really the easiest way to say it. And then there's the whole list of ineligible expenses, which I think most of the ineligible expenses um, are really things that you would expect to see with any other program that provides funding like this from a, from a government. So um, does that, I think that answers the question. So, you know, they also should be reasonable expenses and, you know, the, the, but the big criteria is they must be used directly in, um, in carrying out the project. Thank you very much, Sherry. Uh, next question is from Eric. Is there a minimum size of project? No, there isn't a minimum size. We, we, you know what, when we initially sort of put out the core for proposals, we put some numbers in terms of a range. But when we actually received some project, we noticed that there were a few projects that were a little bit smaller and they're still good projects. So we don't have the minimum, but the maximum is definitely 2.5 million of mica dollars is what we are looking to to submit there, but please don't give us a project asking for for ten dollars either, right? So let's make sure the minimum is not too too too, too small either. Um, next question is from Samuel uh, from ABC Dust, uh, and it's concerning third party contribution, Sherry. And the question is, how can we report them, and specifically international partner contributions? Um, so if we're talking about 
uh, sort of cash contributions to the project. So in the budget workbook for the project funding tab, that they would be listed in there. And as we go through the project, as the project's executed, that's where they would be reported in the in the, the reporting forms. Um, from an in-kind perspective, again, those would be uh, reported when we would do the same way we would do the progress reports for in-kind reporting, if that clarifies it. Gotcha. I think that does. And if not, Samuel, just uh, follow up with me, please, kindly. Okay, next question is from Brian Eaton. And Douglas, I think this is a question for you. Uh, what does the composition of the project selection committee look like? Does it include folks with experience that lines up with the four focal areas, so the four technology focus areas? Uh, example here is, are there people with a background in environment research, uh, management, looking at the proposals in the environmental risk and long-term liabilities uh, technology focus areas? Yes, that's exactly right. So we have the four themes. We have two members of the project selection committee for each of those four themes with slightly different expertise so that we can have uh, sensible uh, opinions expressed about the technical value of the project. We have another two members which are there, one for the implementability of the solutions into operations, either existing operations or future operations. And we have another individual who's there, who's worked for several uh, major OEM companies, has been involved in the commercialization of technologies in the global supply chains. And so they are there to pass an opinion on how easy or difficult it will be for this particular solution to move into those global supply chains. So that's how we've tried to manage uh, the range of issues that come up. We understand, of course, that if we have projects that uh, are focused on underground mines, for example, then the people who are there to uh, offer expertise on tailings and waste management issues won't have a particularly strong opinion on underground technologies and vice versa. And so we will use a weighting system to, to emphasize and de-emphasize the value of opinions from the different uh, technical experts on the program so that the right kind of weight is applied fairly to this broader range of uh, technical subjects. In our earlier uh, network, we had a very narrow range of uh, technical solutions we were looking for in the ultra deep mining network. And so that was very easy. What we recognized was that the mechanism that we involved, that we developed through the UDMN was actually very, very good, but the program was too small and the, the technical range was too narrow. And so we've tried to broaden it out with this MICA network and of course, that then brings in these other issues, exactly the ones that you've raised. And we we have we think we have a mechanism that, that fairly covers off all of those objectives. I hope that answers. Okay, thank you for that, Douglas. Okay, next question is going to be concerning some salary cost comment here and from John. Uh, thank you, John. Uh, the question is, I understand the salary costs for project work undertaken by the proponent are considered as cash rather than in-kind contribution. And John says that's good. Sherry can confirm whether that's indeed good. Uh, what salary costs are eligible? Uh, the direct T4 wage labor uh, includes benefits or overhead. And then another one is NRC projects are use, use pay stub hourly rates uh, plus a fixed NRC mandated overhead percentage. Would it be like that? So yeah, I think that's the one that I previously answered. So it's direct salary costs plus the 55% overhead to cover the uh, benefits and, and overhead, other overhead components, like okay. utilities and things like that. Yeah. Okay, perfect. Thank you, Sherry. Uh, next question is for Michael. Uh, and this is specifically for Sherry. Is the Canadian content just for the last entity in the supply chain, like auto industry? Most parts are from Asia, final assembly in Canada. Um, so, I, if you yeah. so I think what it, what, it, what it would be is it would be yeah. as the as the ultimate recipient or the project proponent, when you yeah. purchase, um, where do you source it from? So do you source it from outside of Canada or do you source it inside of Canada? That would really be the, regardless of, I think, where it's all sort of being put together. It's where you ultimately source it. So think of it, if you were to claim the expense for that, on the project and submit the claim to MICA, would you be submitting that you purchased it in Canada or would you be submitting that you purchased it from a foreign uh, from a forereign market, really? If that yeah, makes sense. 
Thank you, yeah. Sherry. Okay, next question from Oliver is, are there going to be any additional intake rounds in the future? And uh, Oliver, the question answer for you there is, for sure, we know we're going to do one more call. Uh, however, you know, seeing the level of interest that we, we are getting in MICA, uh, we are very, very interested in obviously trying to seek out other uh, money that we can bring to the table so that we can have, you know, subsequent calls. Uh, but as it stands right now, we are definitely going to have one more call. And we think that there's enough projects that are going to come between this call and the next one to be able to uh, take care of any remaining funding that may not be allocated for, for any reason. Uh, Douglas, do you want to maybe add a bit more to that as well? Yes, sure. Yes, there'll be a second call that will likely begin in September and be concluded by January, so that before we get to spring runoff, which is a critical factor for environmental projects, we have to, those projects have to be ready for spring runoff in Canada. And so that's kind of our objective, is to have the second call go out. We will likely evaluate projects that uh, will definitely go forward in, in round one and call for proposal round one. And we will we know for a fact that we're going to have excellent projects that we would like to fund that we will not have sufficient funding to fund them all and we will likely hold some of those back especially the shorter ones and so that we can then gauge uh, what the content of the second round of projects will be so that we can maximize the benefit of the two rounds or two calls for proposals we've already had a conversation with our liaison officer within ICED about additional funding because we recognize that we're already oversubscribed more than we thought and we will be even more oversubscribed when it comes to the second call in September. And he's very enthusiastic about all of that. His other comment was that when we begin to be able to show uh, successful outcomes, commercial outcomes in years one, two, then that would also be an indicator that this is a successful program that the government should then consider to expand the level of funding available and so those are the kinds of criteria that we are already exploring with ICED. Mm -hmm. for now we have what we have to work with and we'll do the best we can with it and it's our obligation as semi to maximize the possible benefit we get from this government funding and to use those results then to generate more funding capacity within the system Excellent, thank you for that answer. Um, next question is from Eric. Uh, the question is, is there a max stacking with federal funding such as IRAP at plus MICA, or is it still 75%? And I think the answer for that first part is it is that 75%. Uh, the next part of the question is, and in case of two different companies under the same ownership, can company A lead a project and purchase products from company B under the same ownership as part of the project? Sherry, over to you. Um, I, I don't think there is anything in there about related parties that I've seen, but I can, I will definitely double check that, um, cause that may be a question that other people have as well, but. Okay. Thank you for that question, Eric. We'll circle back on with an answer there. Uh, another question is from Mo, uh, do the SMEs outlined in the application have to be MICA members or are they eligible as long as they are operating in Canada? So, um. I, I was just going to say that the, so the SMEs outlined in the application as, I guess you're saying as partners in the project. So remember the MICA, the requirement for MICA membership is to the project applicant or the ultimate recipient. There can be obviously other um, partners on the project that, that are being undertaken, but they aren't considered as having a MICA membership. So they would not receive the benefits of MICA membership. They're basically participants in a project, but the ultimate recipient is the one that would be signing the agreement uh, for funding and they're the ones that have to have the MICA membership. So it's not by sort of default or association that if they're in the application and doing work on the project and receiving compensation for it, that they're, that they're, a, they're, an, they're a MICA member. They would have to have their own MICA membership if they wanted to get any of the benefits from, from MICA. Thank you for that, Sherry. Uh, the next question is maybe more of a statement from Michael. And Michael was just saying that he has experience with uh, another funding organization. Uh, and um, he, he did, he did, he's indicating that it could take up to two to three months 
uh, to account for both micro process and the ICF process for for claims and, and paybacks. We will do everything possible to shorten those timeframes as much as, as possible. And I think a lot of that is gonna be, you know, predicated by the, the, the quality of the claims and things like that to help us expedite, making sure that things get done in, this, in a smooth way. Okay, the next question is from Dr. Rob Stevenson. And the question is, as SMEs, you know, we tend to work in silos. Any chance that a short description of all applicant projects are available or potential collaboration? So we do have a micro portal, right? And in the micro portal, there's an area in there where you can put in your innovation and your service, and you can also describe your company. So as a first, maybe stop, stop to discovering who else is in the network, I would encourage you to go to go to, to the portal for that purpose. Uh, but certainly, you know, any projects that are looking for additional partners, if you would like us to share some of your project information with other people, that's a conversation that I'm gonna be having with you over the next couple of weeks or couple of days uh, to see what, what you're willing to share with others so that we can get you the collaborations that you may be looking for, for sure. Uh, but definitely the micro portal is, is gonna be a good place to go to, to find out who else is in the network and what, what their area of interest looks like. Uh, next question here is from Samuel. Can we include IP legal expenses fees into the project? Uh, Sherry, you wanna take that one? Yeah, sorry, I'm just looking that one up in the eligible or ineligible expenses. <laughs> there's something, there's okay. some expenses for IP that are not, uh, oh, sorry, I don't know off the top of my head. I have to just look up what's eligible and ineligible expenses. I think. Okay. Sherry, why are, you look, why are you looking that up? I, I want to just let everybody know that yep. uh, at the end of this call, what we're going to do is we're going to take the video from this call put it on our YouTube channel, and also we'll check the slides that you saw and add them into an, an email and we'll be sending that out to you. Any questions that we we sort of didn't answer, we're going to include those answers in that package as well. Uh, so for example, this IP question is going to be one of those answers that we can include. Yeah, it actually looks like it is answer. eligible. Yeah. Oh, go ahead, thank you. Right now, yeah. Okay, there you go, quick answer, thank you, Sherry. Uh, the next question we have here is um, from uh, Paul, I believe. Are we plugged into, I think, VCs, uh, venture capital, or other investors to top up MICA dollars? Uh, the answer to that que question, Paul, is at this time, no, we don't have any direct access to any set aside funds from any VC group. But I will say this to you, though, that, uh, you know, there are follow on funding entities like Mars that we are, that are part of our, the MICA network, who will be paying attention to which MICA projects are fundable at that next level. Uh, and also, I think, you know, any MICA proponent who is looking for that level of assistance, there are some mechanisms we put through through the membership system where you may be able to ask us for additional help to seek those additional dollars as well. Um, Douglas, any additional comments on that one? Yeah, sure. Okay. Uh, I think the important thing to remember here is that this particular webinar is about the, the funding for the technical projects. But the primary reason for the MICA network is actually the network activity, and it is to help organizations to scale up with uh, investment. What we've recognized from our earlier efforts has been that most SMEs don't actually have all the skill sets and all the answers that they need in order to represent themselves well in front of investors or other major mining companies. So one of the activities of the, the network activities is actually to help companies to recognize these are the questions. We've had an experience before, for example, when we've encouraged a, a small SME to go and meet with a potential client who immediately loved the idea and wanted a thousand units uh, per month. And the SME, of course, was nowhere close to being able to provide a thousand units per month. And so that was the end of that conversation and the whole opportunity disappeared. What we want to be able to do with all of the SMEs that engage with us at MICA is not just in the technical program, but in the network as a network, is to be prepared for those kinds of answers before you go. Oftentimes, if, if you go too early, when you don't have the right answers to the right questions, then uh, the opportunity for a second opportunity is very, very limited. And so that really takes us into the realm of what the network is for. And the government's primary reason for funding the MICA network was actually to generate a national network. So it goes back to the issue of silos that was brought up before. We understand that SMEs often are working in a silo. So the first purpose of the network is to actually try and make as many SMEs as possible be fully aware of all the other SMEs out there with whom they can collaborate, with whom they can synergize 
so that both companies can increase their scale and market reach faster than they will if they continue to work in their own silo. So the network is the primary objective of the government funding. It is not the technical programs, although this is what this webinar is about. Okay, thank you for that, Douglas. Uh, we have a question here from Payman, and we are just over time here, so maybe we'll quickly go through this. The question from Payman is, do we have to have partners at the beginning of the project or can we recruit them along the way? Uh, Douglas, do you want to take that one? Uh, I don't think there's any requirement to have uh, all of the answers at the beginning of the project, so long as the project is regarded as something that clearly is going to end up with a valuable outcome in terms of a product or service, exactly how that evolves as time goes on. This is still a four-year program. Uh, the second call for proposals, of course, will only be a three and a half year program because that's the time limits that we have. So within the confines of the program that we have at the present time, uh, yes, we we need to, we recognize that what will be happening is that the organizations will be evolving as time goes on through the program. But in order to be approved in the first case, you're going to have to have sufficient pieces of the puzzle pulled together that it has a credible uh, opportunity or pathway to a successful outcome. Exactly. Thank you for that answer, Douglas. Uh, and the last question we're going to take today is uh, from Andre. And the question is, can funding come from foreign mining companies? And then Sherry, maybe answer that question, please. Um. I, I believe funding can come from foreign mining companies if it's mm -hmm. coming into Canada um, and the project work is being undertaken here. Um, I guess as long as there's no sort of, uh, I guess in the project agreement that we sign or the funding agreement, there can't be any sort of stipulation that, you know, there is still that the IP has to remain in Canada. There's those types of things. So if, if a foreign mining company wants to, you know, fund um, work that's being undertaken in Canada, that would be okay. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay, yeah. 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 Douglas, go ahead. To go beyond that, in actual fact, it's desirable because what that would indicate is that there's a global market for that particular product or service that will be developed as a result of the project. Yeah. So that is actually a desirable outcome. We're not trying to create a network that generates uh, successful technical solutions for use only in Canada. Canada is actually a relatively small market. The purpose of the exercise is to help Canadian SMEs grow faster and uh, become stronger companies so that they can participate in global supply chains. So in actual fact, getting project funding from foreign companies that are interested in that technology is a really good thing to have. Gotcha. All right, thank you so much, Douglas. Okay, everybody, we are four minutes over and we want to just thank you again for taking your time to come on this call and hearing us speak to you about the full application and process and overview. If you have any questions from us, please don't hesitate to email us, um, book a meeting with us, and we'll be more than glad to answer your questions. So please expect to get in your email before the end of the day, the link to the video and the PowerPoint slides so that you can have those, um, you can rewatch this if you so desire. Yeah. All right, uh, uh, on that note, thank you again, everybody. Have a nice day. Talk to you all real soon. You take care.